So there has been a few new LLM announcements recently. Twitter or X have just announced Grok, which is their new LLM. Right now it's an early beta. Now let's check out the details. So it was trained for two months. They, did, they underwent two months of training. They say they'll be updating it ra rapidly and improving it rapidly. They're using Twitter for training data uh, as a backbone for knowledge and uh, training data for Grok. And let's see, so here it says, why are we building Grok? So they say they want to design AI tools that, you, that are useful to people of all backgrounds and political views. So what's interesting about this thing is like, um, it's far more uncensored than other counterparts such as Claude 2 or ChatGPT. And, you know, some say that makes it more appealing. And of course, right now it's being used as a marketing ploy. Um, and we'll see how the performance is. It's quite restricted right now. Again, it's an early access um, beta. So not many people have access to it. So let's continue going. So it's a, yeah, I get, I've highlighted a lot of stuff here. So um, this was developed for over four months. I think, um, now they've gone through many iterations. They say they trained a prototype model called Grok Zero, which was 33 billion parameters. This early model approached Llama 270 billion in capabilities. And now in the last two months, they were training Grok One, um, which achieved 63.2 on human eval coding task and 73% on MMLU. Now, furthermore, Grok, um, Grok One, these are the benchmarks they used. These are quite ubiquitous in machine learning. Now, yeah, here I highlighted the math. Under the math, it fell a bit short compared to Palm. Um, yeah, the, the performance fell a bit short, and it matches, um, but if, yeah, but it matches GPT three point five. But yeah, um, so the math performance is quite. Uh, uh, in general, yeah, the performance of Grok one is quite. Good. It's it, given its size and given how many, how long it was trained for, it's actually pretty decent. Um, it's doing far better than Llama two, and we can see Grok one. Um, sorry, we can see Grok zero here. Um, Grok zero is basically equivalent to Llama two, so they're in a good sweet spot here, um, given the amount of time they trained for. Now, they are saying that they can't rule out that. Um, these models were invertedly trained on these benchmarks, right? You know, all these models here. There could have been some contamination. So they try to use a novel or new um, benchmark. They took out this Hungarian National High School Finals exam in mathematics. It was published end of May of 2013, this year. And so they collected that. And so that, so that was after um, the data set, right? Um, that was used to train Grok. So they scored 59% or C, Claw 2 scored 55 and GPT-4 scored uh, 68%. So GPT-4 of course is, is doing pretty good, um, but it's far bigger so, um, and trained for longer, so um, there's that. Um, See so here, the engineering of XAI. Um, so they created Grok, they used uh, custom training inference stack of Kubernetes, Rust and Jax. Furthermore, when training, we synchronize computations across tens of thousands of GPUs. So again, there was a lot of news of them buying so many GPUs. You know, no one, everyone was wondering like, is is um, X and Tesla cross pollination going on in terms of compute? They did stumble upon many challenges um, in creating the infrastructure. Um, to to train this um, large language model, they said all these failure modes were became frequent due to the scale, and then the to overcome these challenges, they employed a set of custom distributed systems that ensure that every type of failure is immediately identified. So they yeah they did um, I guess distribution and then um, that way um, they spread their eggs right from the basket and that sort of helped um, um, with training here. Yeah. And again, this is a new team. I mean, XAI is quite fresh. They're still getting their bearings together. Now, they are preparing for a next jump in mode model capabilities, which will require reliable coordinating training runs. So again, um, now they're trying to get that more. They're trying to get more XP. 
scaling their compute and scaling their accelerators. So this is sort of their mission statement. So they say, we believe that achieving reliable reasoning is the most important um, research direction to address the limitations of current systems. So they highlight their promising research directions. So scalable oversight with tool assistance. So AI can assist with scalable oversight by looking up references from different sources, verifying intermediate steps with external tools and seeking human feedback when necessary. And next was the integrating with formal verification for safety, reliability and grounding. Um, They say one major immediate goal of this approach is to give formal guarantees for code correctedness, especially regarding from. So again, they're talking about mitigating hallucinations and creating um, verification. This is quite challenging to achieve. Um, I mean, OpenAI, they, they set up a whole cryptography camp where they had Scott Aronson trying to um, create watermarks and um, a verification system for information and correctedness. This is a pretty much a long-standing problem. And they say long context understanding and retrieval. So many people are pursuing that. Adversarial robustness. Oh, so basically, they were um, narrowing down on uh, vulnerabilities and weaknesses in the in deep learning models. So such as prompt injections, um, which is quite an infamous um, um, thing right now, and um, stark v- vulnerability. Uh, multimodal capabilities. Currently, Croc doesn't have any other sensors such as vision, so they're going to be enhancing and working on that. It's early access um, right now. They have limited, only in the United States, they have limited access only to the United States, and Croc is a prototype. Now, here's the model card. It has a bit more details. It shows like it's an autoregressive transformer based model. Um, of course, we knew that. And now, the model was then it was fine-tuned using extensive feedback from both humans and the early uh, Grok Zero models and has a context length of 8192 tokens. Um, Its limitations, the Grok 1 language model does not have the capability to search the web independently. Um, Search tools and databases enhance the capabilities and factualness of, um, of the model when deployed in Grok. Um, the model can still hallucinate despite the access to external information sources. Yeah, that's an unsolved problem. I mean, even Bing uh, hallucinates. Um, so training data, very important question. So the training data is up to comes both from the internet up to Q3 2023 and the data provided by our AI tutors. So these um, get, um, the AI tutors, of course, are just the annotators and um, this is the people providing the human feedback. I think that's it for Grok. Um, it's quite interesting. It's nice. To, it's interesting because this came out, was announced before OpenAI's Dev Day. So it got a lot of attention, especially because one of the um, researchers in the XAI, um, Greg Yang, he po- made a post showcasing how unfiltered this model is. So sort of showing off um, the characteristics of the model. Anyway, Let's delve into OpenAI's uh, Dev Day. So in OpenAI's Dev Day, there was so many announcements. So starting with uh, GPT-4 Turbo with a context length of 128K. Now, this is quite impressive, of course, but um, the fidelity of the context length is very important. And we've seen this before um, with Claude 2. Claude 2 has a context length of 100K. So this isn't particularly new. Um, The question is the quality of that context length. There's a paper that came out a few months ago called Lost in the Middle. I did cover it simultaneously alongside um, Claude 2. And that paper just showed that language models, they have this tendency to remember information predominantly in the beginning and the end of a context window, and they forget the middle. Uh, tremendously. So this is why increasing the context length seems like a bit redundant, um, especially with this um, open problem. But we'll see if the we see the fidelity of this context length, and I'm sure it's going to introduce so many different use cases. Um, um, even if the fidelity is very lossy, it still can be very useful. So just for to put into perspective, a context length of 128 would be. Um, it says here 300 pages. It's basically almost 80,000 words. Um, an interesting thing was GPT-4 Turbo is going to be 3x cheaper 
um, for input tokens and 2x cheaper for output tokens and GPT-4. Um, next, they had function calling. It lets you describe functions of your app, external APIs to models, and have the model inte intelligently intelligently choose to start with JSON objects containing arguments to call those functions. Many um, developers had issues where um, they'd constantly have to remind the model to, to output JSON. Um, so this is very um, helpful. And they have JSON mode. Uh, JSON mode is useful for developers um, generating JSON and chat completion API outside of function calling. And they did reproducible outputs and log probabilities where they basically ex uh, mentioned that, you know, we have this issue where when someone shares their prompts and their output, there's this problem of reproducibility. You can give someone a prompt and um, they'll get a separate different result. So here they're trying to introduce a sort of system, um, especially for enterprise cases and developers to help them sort of get reproducible um, results, reproducible outputs. Um, with the same level of quality um, rather than a mixed bag. So they've also launched the return log probabilities and that's very helpful to be able to generate consistent um, output tokens. They announced an upgrade for GPT 3.5 Turbo and it supports 16,000 uh, K context window by default. And so that's a pretty big upgrade. Here they had assistance API uh, retrieval and code inter interpreter. Um, so it's, it's a big step towards helping developers build agent-like experiences. The interesting thing about this is it mixes everything sort of together. You have the vision in there, you have Dali in there, you have Bing in there, you have search in there. So everything is in there. So um, it's a purpose-built AI that has specific instructions, leverages extra knowledge and can call models and tools to perform tasks. This basically can help with the heavy lifting and with retrieval. So they go into ta the tackling retrieval here um, now rags, rags and vector databases was is quite a big thing in the AI startup space. So many of the developers um, or, um, who are present had their product roadmaps maybe a bit disrupted. Some startups, of course, maybe went bust. I think things like Langchain are quite secure. So much details about rag augmentation capabilities from OpenAI. Um, it just seems very surface level. Um, whereas, you know, if you want to implement this in an enterprise, you need something more um, detailed. Again, this is um, a full on uh, disruption on, as you can see here, stored embeddings and documents. So and chunking, you see, so a lot of um, question marks about how they're doing this. It's going to make developers lives much easier and many developers won't have to worry about external knowledge. So we'll see. So another thing they had was model customization. Um, so GPT-4 fine-tuning experimental access. Basically, they are going to have um, fine-tuning for GPT-4, and they've done some improvements for GPT-3.5 fine-tuning. They're also going to do custom models for um, companies. They say here yeah, applicable to domains with extremely large proprietary data sets, billions of tokens minimum. They're going to have a custom models program. I did see on Twitter someone did post um, for this program, I sure like to expect to spend a million to two million. So, um, getting a custom fine-tuned model um, for your specific domain from OpenAI comes at a hefty price. But this is pretty good service for them to provide. And the, I think one of the biggest thing next up here is the lower prices and higher rate limits. So GPT-4 Turbo again is three x cheaper for input tokens and two x cheaper for output tokens. And 3.5 also has a price reduction and and even fine-tuned GPT 3.5 Turbo 4K model also has um, price reductions. So it seems the economics of scale is really kicking in. This is really good for developers. Uh, many things are becoming more more um, tangible and more economical. There's one idea which is like using um, LLMs in video games, right, to generate. Um, stories and text. We had Smallville, which did uh, did um, experiment with this, but that, but one game session uses so many tokens. So it seems sooner or later, economics of scale of, you know, that is coming to play here will bring things closer and closer to zero in terms of um, cost per token. And then lastly, they introduced the, one of the most important things. They introduced um, GPTs 
which are basically agents that anyone could share with each other, easily build their own GPT no coding required, it says, and this basically replaces plugins. In February, I believe they released plugins, and Sam Altman, the CEO of OpenAI, he said like they, they really struggled to find product market fit with plugins and still haven't um so gpt's I, I guess now we see why they trademarked um, gpt and one of the big things with plugins is you couldn't share them so it's nice to be able to share gpt's um which is very cool and um, it's easy to share you can create your own custom one and the only downside i'll say is that uh, these things are called agents but um they don't have extreme autonomy it's still just a a one-on-one -on -one chat interface or chatbot, you know. So what would be more interesting is um, an agent which you can sort of unleash. But anyway, so then now they have the GPT store rolling out later this month. So they did introduce revenue sharing. That was another thing that there was not present with plugins. Many developers were struggling to create monetization. That's do monetization externally. You can see they're trying to create their own app store. And... It's a good direction. They want to be a more of a platform. So yeah, positioning themselves as a platform would be the most profitable route instead of trying to hinge on one product. And the one product they should just be hinging on is um, LLMs themselves or GPT-5, um, um, that base model. Because again, all these GPTs are, are built on, will be built on top of it. Again, it's it's quite fascinating the direction we're going in um, this the space of the space of LLMs, and they do say GPTs will continue to get more useful and smarter, and you'll eventually be able to let them take on real tasks in the real world. And yeah, that's sort of what we're anticipating, aren't we? So we'll see when that comes out. Um, and again, there's many startups working on agents, so um, so that was another point of disruption. But at least now the ecosystem um, is moving into a GPT store, so um, people can build it in there and compete in that, and it's pretty good. Um, it's pretty clever. And they say, like plugins, actions allow GPTs to integrate external data and interact with the real world, connect GPTs to databases, plug them into emails, or make them your shopping assistant, for example. You could integrate a travel listing database, connect a user's email inbox, or facilitate e-commerce orders. You can now empower users inside your company to design internal GPTs without code and, and securely polish them to your workspace. And they lastly say, we designed GPTs so more people can build with us, involving the communities critical to our mission of building safe AGI that benefits humanity. It allows everyone to see a wide and varied range of useful GPTs and get a more concrete sense of what's ahead. Again, this is just another way of them trying to encourage devs to build on their um, store. But yeah, that was the list of announcement of Dev Day. Um, pretty interesting the direction we're going. Um, again, many startups went bust, and I think the only question remains is like where. Where is Google? 